Thank you, Keen Adventist Elementary School. Can I hear another amen? amen? Beautiful music, and not just the notes and the sounds coming from the handbells and the marimbas and the voices, but the fact that it was coming from the heart. I can think of fewer things that warm my heart more than to see a young person singing to God, their creator, with all their heart. Amen? Beautiful, beautiful. Unless it might be topped or paralleled by kids in service. Some of, these, some of these kids that were up here today, we spent some time in service with this week on Thursday at uh, Lake Whitney Ranch in the Adventist Community Service Depot. They are singing and living out their faith, and what a joy it is to be with them. Thank you, Miss Innie, and your team uh, for all you did to make this happen today. It's a joy. <clears throat> Special congratulations also. I can't forget Tiago. Uh, we are so proud of Tiago for jumping in for Jesus today and uh, declaring him as your best friend. And it was great to see father and son in the baptistry today. Wasn't that awesome? What a beautiful thing. We're so proud of your decision. May God continue to be your best friend, Tiago, and guide you. Uh, And one other congratulations are in order. Uh, If you have been busy this week or hadn't caught the word, we have another reason to celebrate among our church family and church staff especially. Uh, Last Sabbath... During the time of Upper Room, fittingly so, uh, our youth pastor, Erica Barnett, and her husband, Nick, uh, welcomed their first child into the world. Zephaniah Wilder Barnett was was welcomed into the world, and they are doing fine. I'm told that mom and, and, and baby did great. They're home. They're adjusting to life with their first addition to their family, or first human addition. They have a dog that they've been training as a child. Uh, for a while now, but uh, we're glad that Zephaniah made its way safely into the world, and we're so excited to see him uh, eventually as they are able to get adjusted to life and return uh, back into ministry here in our midst in a a few weeks. Uh, But if you get a chance, just uh, send them a message and uh, welcome little Zephaniah into our community, our forever family. One other thing I should mention, if you are here today and and you say, man, I really enjoyed seeing kids lead out in worship. I can do a quick little commercial, and then we'll get into our message. Uh, coming up at the end of April, Keene Adventist Elementary students, every year we do a student-led week of worship. It will be streamed online. It will happen here in this space uh, during the morning time, weekday mornings for five days. So if you know of somebody who would like to see that or you would like to be blessed by their preaching and their singing and and everything, then we invite you to tune in on our Keen Church YouTube channel for that. Look for information on that. The last week, I believe, of April. So today, as you saw in the video bumper, we are heading into launch, continuing in our sermon series on the power that started a revolution. That Holy Spirit power revealed in the book of Acts as the early church was launched into creation and into service in this world. We've been through chapters one through four, and um, I'm gracious to Pastor Michael, who has laid the foundation there and allowed me to share in the pulpit time today. Uh, He is not just on vacation, he is out serving. Uh, He drives, um, has a CDL license, and is driving some of our students down on a choral trip, spending some time with our academy students this week. So really appreciate our, our lead pastor being willing to do that. And so while he, he's away, he graciously gave us this, this chapter, which is next story to consider. Acts chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, let's read verses 1 through 11 today. But there was a certain man named Ananias, who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away, Scripture says. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to who? God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. 
About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter asked her, what was, was this the price that you and your husband received for the land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, well, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the, Holy, the Spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young man, men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. So I want to thank Pastor Michael for leaving us this warm and fuzzy children's bedtime story to consider in our time together today. Last time I was with you, we covered the story of Japheth sacrificing his daughter, making a rash vow. So I'm not sure if I, what I'll say next time Pastor Michael asked me to preach. But um, at any rate, I will resist the pastoral urge right now to take up an offering. After that passage, it kind of seems like now might be a good time, but we won't go that route. I think it's a better time to ask for some wisdom. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word, this unchanging source of truth. We thank you for the story, your story, of Jesus coming down to rescue man. And you didn't leave us alone. You gave us the great gift of the Holy Spirit. And as we've celebrated that in recent weeks, Lord, we come to a difficult part of the story today. And perhaps we need an extra dose of your Holy Spirit right now to understand, to gain insight. Show us where your grace appears in this moment of judgment, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So to first understand this difficult passage, we need to look at the context of Acts chapter 5. This story takes place in the launch, as we said, of the Christian church. We started in chapters 1 through 4. Don't forget those previous lessons, okay? The disciples were waiting and waiting for the Holy Spirit, the promised gift. And then, in anticipation and in unity, they were in the upper room. And at Pentecost, this gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out, enabling them to speak in tongues, to do miracles. Even to the extent that wherever Peter and John went, people chased after their shadows just to, in the hopes of being healed. God's Spirit was alive and active, Right? They prayed for boldness, and they got it. These were uneducated and untrained men, but they were shaking the world for God. People, in fact, noticed, as we read last week, that they had, quote, been with who? Jesus. Wouldn't you like that to be said of each of us? They were sold out to their rabbi and wanted to turn this world upside down. Chapter 4 in this story ends with a few verses. These these are not going to be on the screen, but just just catch these for a moment. Acts 4, verse 33 to 35. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all, for there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each to the extent that any had need. There were no homeless, there were no people starving, because God's people came to work, amen? The Holy Spirit moved in their hearts, and they had compassion that they had never had before, and they gave sacrificially, and when we do that, friends, God blesses. I'll never forget, as a young young pastor, younger pastor, um, several years ago, I was, I was in a church where we were having a, um, a stewardship campaign, and it wasn't one of those exciting campaigns like you might think of building a new sanctuary, something you're going to raise up from the ground. This was a let's get out of debt campaign, necessary, um, and, uh, but sometimes not as exciting. And the call was made to give sacrificially. And I remember this one couple that was not particularly wealthy, had, still had uh, teenagers living at home in their house, and they already had put their house on the market. They sold it, just a middle-class uh, family, and as they sold it, and this was several years ago, they got a check for $50,000, I think. 
And that was their, their profit. And wow, what a great thing to have that. I mean, I could tell you a lot of things I would do with 50 grand, right? And they came to church one day with it and they said, you know, before we're tempted to do anything else with this, we want to hand this over to the Lord for his purpose. And I sat there and I said, wow, that made an impression on my heart. That had to have been hard to do. And so I'm sure there were siren voices talking in their head, but that's the kind of giving that we see in the early Christian church. We think of God and his cause. We take care of our needs, but we know that God is going to bless us above. And we don't have to have every necess- necessarily every want that we wish for. This was the norm in the early church. Notice that despite there was persecution happening a little bit in chapter 4 with them getting arrested in prison, our temptation might be to go and have a prayer session to pray for deliverance and protection, right? No. They don't pray for deliverance and protection. They pray for boldness. And God gives them the Holy Spirit and greater power. And they're able to witness for him. This is the climate as we go into Acts chapter 5. Even at the end of chapter 4, they mention a man by the name of Barnabas who specifically was called the son of encouragement, and he gave and, and, and gave his goods to the Lord. Mention him by name. So perhaps some of these people were well-known as they brought their gifts and well-appreciated for what they donated to the cause of Christ. Things are going so well, the church seems about ready to launch and really take off around the world. But before the heat of persecution sets in, And those engines are turned on before the gospel warriors are truly launched to the Gentiles, to the far corners of the earth. It's as if there's an inspection done by the Lord. Now, NASA will tell you anytime a rocket goes off, there are multiple inspections, right? They come in and they have test chambers that they test the O-rings and the seals and the, the metals for heat resistance in the atmosphere and all sorts of things. And they shake it up and they simulate winds and every test imaginable to make sure that that rocket is going to be safe as it launches. Could it be that that's what's happening here? Things are going good, got a good foundation, got the Holy Spirit, we're ready to launch, but sometimes when things are going really good, the devil gets his foot in the door, and so the Lord comes down for an inspection, I like to think of it. He's testing the church's integrity. And in Acts 5, 1 to 11, we find a flaw. A flaw that could be harmful to the early Christian community. Number two, secondly, I want to look at the understanding of not just what that current climate there, but the understanding of Israelite history. You see, there were a couple of incidences in Israelite history, and these were all Jews that were becoming part of the Christian church at that point, right? The ministry started in Jerusalem. They hadn't yet worked out far into the, to the other regions. So they knew and understood some stories. Two stories in particular stand out in Old Testament history that are similar to the story of Ananias and Sapphira. You may remember a man by the name of Achan. Stories recorded in Joshua chapter 7, verses 10 to 26. We're not going to read it today, but I'll just summarize it for you. Just like later in the book of Acts, when the, when the people of God were on the cusp of something great, the people back in Joshua's day had waited in the wilderness, and they had learned lessons of obedience, and they were ready to cross over into the promised land. And as they're getting ready to cross over, it's a new chapter. And... It's like an inspection is done again. You see, there was a military victory, and in the middle of that victory, Achan sees a bunch of cool stuff that he wants to take from the the enemy. And he grabs, I don't know, a Babylonian robe and some gold and treasure and stuff, and he takes it, sneaks it back to his tent, buries it under his family belongings. The family is all clued in. There's no way they didn't know about this. It's buried underneath their stuff, lots of it. And he thinks no one knows except his immediate family. But, of course, Joshua calls him out. God says, there is a sin in your camp. He uses this phrase from God, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Whoa. Did you catch that? Do we have enemies today? Does the enemy want to tear us down? Maybe there's some self-examination, some, something inside of us. We need to submit to the Lord first before we stand before the devil and try to fight our own battles. We can't do that. We'll fall flat on our face. And so after that that encounter, after that treasure being hidden, Joshua calls people together, announces for, for people to come forward. No one does. He goes through by tribe and by clan and works his way down to household. Only when Achan is called forward and individually confronted 
does he admit to what he has done? And then it's too late. Boys and girls, as you're listening, I want to remind you, if your teacher ever says, did anybody know where my eraser went? Does anybody know who left this trash or didn't do that chore? Anybody know why Johnny's crying? Anybody know what happened? I know those things never happen in in your classroom, but if they do, I sure hope you're honest and you come forward. Aiken had to learn too late and too hard by his own uh, denial that that's not the way to go. So his family was stoned and their, their possessions were burned. Serious lesson. Fast forward six or 700 years later, and then we have a man by the name of Gehazi, 2 Kings chapter 5. You may remember the prophet Elisha. Elisha was called upon for this great moment where he was to heal, called upon to heal an Assyrian king, Naaman. It was his second contact, as far as we know, with an Israelite. And as Naaman comes into the camp and approaches the prophet, the prophet tells him, go dip in the river seven times. He's not sure about that. He's leaving. He finally does it. And after he does it, he's so grateful that he's he's cured of this terrible, incurable, shameful disease that he wants to offer a gift of thank you. And he has all these riches and he tries to give it to the prophet. But Elisha says, no, 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 no. This is from God. He wanted him to know that this, God sent them. That you should love Jehovah. Don't love me. I'm just an instrument. And as he did that, someone was watching his servant, Gehazi. And Gehazi says, oh, huh, well, you're not going to take it, Elisha. Huh. And so as Naaman's chariot rushes off, Gehazi's like, oh, hold on a minute, Elisha. I forgot something. He runs after the chariot and he goes and he says, um, you know, my master changed his mind. Why don't you go ahead and fork that over? And he takes the treasure and carries it back. But Elisha knows what game he's up to. He comes back and questions him on it. He admits his behavior. And Gehazi is given Naaman's leprosy. Not just Gehazi, but his descendants as well. Rough day. So what about the sin of Ananias and Sapphira? If you were to identify the problem here, the root sin, what is it? What is so bad to warrant not just uh, leprosy, not just capital punishment, but immediate death being stricken down by the Lord, stricken down by the Lord? We find in this account in particular that it's a a little more severe because not only do they have the case studies in Israelite history, not only were things going so well and they knew the expectation, but the problem is, is that they talked together on this. There was intentionality. Scripture says he talked to his wife, and they both decided, and they both agreed that they should hide this money from the Lord. Now, Scripture is clear that they didn't have to even give, right? It says the money was yours. It was in your possession. So the sin here is not necessarily greed. Greed is what starts it off, but God's not killing them because they're greedy, right? There's something else. There's intentionality here as their greed feeds off of each other. It leads to worse sins. As they're talking, they're in agreement, which, you know, as we do prepare and rich, as we counsel, uh, it's a program that we use to counsel uh, couples when they're getting married. Uh, That whole survey is based on factors of commonality. So if a, if a, a, Two fiancés are, are dating and they, and they both agree on how to spend money or how to raise children. Their score on the survey is pretty high. Well, Ananias and Sapphira would have scored high on this because they were in agreement, but this is a moment where it's not a good thing, right? We're supposed to be helpmates for a reason. There are times when we have to pull our spouse down away from a bad decision and we have to encourage them in a godly way, not the direction their selfish desires are taking them. So they are co-conspirators in this. So greed, <clears throat> there's a chain of sins here. We go from greed to covetousness. Covetousness, what were they coveting? Well, it was a little bit of coveting when they first saw what they wanted to take, right? And, and, and keep that money. But really the covetous comes in not with money. They were coveting a reputation. They wanted to be like Barnabas. They wanted their name is in scripture. Well, they got their names in Scripture, (laughs) but not for the reason they wanted, right? So Ananias and Sapphira are coveting esteem. They're coveting honor in addition to their greed for the money. They give part to the Lord thinking they'll still be okay. We're still going to march in that room, and people will see us march in the room. They're going to see us go talk to Peter and lay this stuff down at his feet. Somebody will be impressed. 
We'll have good standing. Maybe we'll get asked by the nominating committee to be a deacon or an elder. Yeah, it'll be good. But we'll just keep some extra. Maybe we can go on a vacation soon. Again, they didn't have to give any of this. This was not tied. This was voluntary giving, but they had made a commitment to give it to the Lord, and then they backed off of that. Why is that so bad? Well, this leads to lying, of course, and the lying, the combination of greed, covetousness, and lying, leading to lying, ended up living a life in that moment of great hypocrisy. Let's talk about that word for just a minute. What is hypocrisy? Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 is that famous passage that talks about the seven things that God hates, and it lists the seven, what some people call seven deadly sins. Four or five of them are sins that Ananias and Sapphira commit right, right here. Greed, conspiring, rushing towards evil, okay? Things that God hates. It's also interesting to mention that, that in Revelation 22 mentions in, in verse 15 that those outside the gates of heaven one day are gonna be not just murderers and sorcerers, but it says those who live and practice a lie. What do you call living and practicing a lie? I call it hypocrisy. The word hypocrite comes from a Greek word used to describe someone wearing a mask in a theatrical sense. Now, nothing wrong with theater. It was just a way to describe what happened at the time in their day. You see, in Bible times, they would tell stories, sometimes with words. The Greeks did a lot of this. And they would do it in different ways, sometimes mind in, in the Romans did actually uh, a lot of speaking theater. There was both that was done. But do you ever wear a mask? Do you ever pretend to be somebody you're not? Um, I venture to say that some of us, maybe all of us do at some point, maybe daily, maybe weekly. And some of it's pretty innocuous, not too bad. It might be that, you know, we get home after a long day of work and, and maybe... Uh, Someone in the house, a kid or a spouse, is, is talking at length about something that really you don't have the energy to fully sit and listen to. So you put on your mask, right? Oh, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I got to go to bed. And you pretend to be ready for bed rather than listen. Maybe, maybe you, um, someone asks you how you're doing. And you put on the mask. You say, oh, I'm great. Happy Sabbath. Do you have a happy Sabbath mask? We all probably do, don't we? We don't want to go into the details of what maybe our week was like. But in reality, we might should be wearing one of these faces, right? Or maybe it's just as simple as a front that we put on at work or at school. Maybe somebody says something, they laugh, they mention a joke that we know we probably shouldn't be laughing at. Maybe the joke is at somebody else's expense. And we sit there and we laugh and we smile. Ha, <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. When inside we know we shouldn't be. We put on a mask because we want to be popular or we want to be liked or we want esteem. It's a little bit of hypocrisy. Now, I'm not here to judge anyone. We've, like I say, we've all done it. And, and to some extent, we do it pretty regularly. And some of that is fairly harmless. Hypocrisy is simply put is pretending. Do you want to be a pretender? Do you want to live your life being a pretender or do you want to be genuine? I say I'm one thing, but my actions reveal otherwise. Which I, if I say I'm a diehard Democrat and I vote on a split ticket, that's not a big deal. If I say my favorite ice cream is, is um, Rocky Road, but I usually get butter pecan, that's not hurting anybody, right? But saying I love Jesus above all everything else and living my life where my bank account and my calendar and my playlist and my conversations and my social media would reveal something totally different, that's a different story. It's a different level of hypocrisy. We are being pretenders. In practical terms, I'm robbing God of the witness that he deserves. I am testifying otherwise. You see, when you say you're a Christian, you're either witnessing for or against Christ by your lifestyle. There's no in between. If we sit on the fence or we're too passive, we end up 
sending a message that following, that following God is not really that important. Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary talking about Ananias and Sapphira says they were attempting to serve both God and man, one foot in each door, on each side, in each camp. Now you say, Pastor, okay, I realize we do that, but what's the huge deal? I want you to think for a minute on the implications of hypocrisy for just a moment. A study was done several years ago by Barna Group. They research Christians and, and, and non-Christians alike, and, and they, their goal is to kind of find out how the church is doing every year. And they surveyed what they call outsiders, which are people that are unchurched, not involved in any faith group, per se. And they asked them, do you know a Christian personally, an active, born-again Christian? And 84% of, the, of those questions said, yes, I know a Christian. Then they, the next question came. They said, okay, you know a Christian. How many of those people you know, does the person you're thinking of live their life by different values? Do they lead a better life? Do their beliefs change them, or are they just like you? Only 15% of those 84% actually said that, yes, the Christian I'm thinking of has different values. They're a different person. They're a better person. Only 15%. What does that say about the other, what, 69%? David Kinneman goes on to argue, and he was the, the president of Barna w- when this was done. Um, he says, the only way this will be addressed is, is if Christians themselves get a grip on what it means to follow Christ and then convey it authentically to the world. What is behind many, not all, but many changes and accusations against the character and integrity of Christians is the demand for perfection in the life of anyone who claims to be a Christian and urges to others to consider Christianity as well. So you see what he's saying? The problem is this high standard of perfection. He says, this is not, of course, the true meaning of a hypocrite, but even more to the point, it's not an accurate understanding of what it means to enter into the Christian life. Yet the world holds us to it because we hold ourselves and others to it. We fall prey to the charge of hypocrisy because we have reduced spirituality, get this, to a list of moral benchmarks coupled with a good dose of judgmentalism. Ouch. We've got to be careful, don't we? We believe the law of God. We hold up the standard high as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, but we've got to be careful that that is not the sum total of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen? Come on. I should have gotten a better amen on that. <laughs> Do you want to live your life being judged for the do's and don'ts, what you don't eat, what you do eat, what you see, what you don't see? Is that how God views us, or does he view us in a relative relative sense, as a friend? Does he look at us and say, are you committed to me? How much of your heart do I have? And the rest will follow. God does not look at the outward appearance. That's what man looks at. God looks at the heart. It's time to live in honest Transparent communities where we're not known for where we go and what we wear, for the house we live in or the letters behind our name. We're not known for the things we don't do as much as the ministries that we do. We are known for kindness we exhibit. We're known for the Christian values we cherish, for the countercultural ways that we spend our time, and for the one who changes our hearts and our focus. Lastly, well, next to the last, (laughs) one thing that helps us understand this passage is understanding the communal nature of sin and judgment, but also the nature of obedience and blessing. You see that this this, um, communal idea of what sin does in our midst and, and, and the opposite of that, what righteousness does in our midst, is not common in our Western way of thinking. We think, I'm an individual. I'm in charge of my own life. I'm going to do my own thing, right? And we're proud of that. It's the American dream. But that's not biblical values. That's not the biblical worldview. The biblical worldview says that what I do affects you and what you do affects me. 
If moral values were not contagious among people, why would we be concerned about who our children hang out with and date? Right? I dare say that most parents in this room probably have some opinion on that subject. And probably for some sort of moral reason. You see, sin is contagious. Bad choices spread quickly. We bring each other down in groups sometimes. Or we have the option, by God's grace, to bring each other up. And Scripture challenges us to do that. Oh, there's several, questions, several scriptures that speak to this. In the Old Testament, scriptures like, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will forgive them and heal their land. It uses language, collective language like that. And even though we don't live in a theocracy anymore, you see similar language like that in the New Testament. Households were baptized together because there was this idea of let's travel together on this. We're making a decision as a household. In the book of Acts, people join, not just the father, but the father and the whole family come in together. Nations and kingdoms have been hurt because of poor decisions of one leader, or they've been blessed due to the repentance and the revival that happens in a neighborhood, a state, or a country. The blessings of obedience to God can be transferred even to a person who doesn't know God. I know a friend of mine in this church, many of you know, who told me his testimony and said that he became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian because he hung around other Christians and eventually he just watched their behavior and he said, finally one day, I want whatever you're drinking. <laughs> I'm ready to drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak, because I see the fruits of God in your life. Lastly, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 7 shows us the severity of what Ananias and Sapphira did. This is an Old Testament promise, a prediction of this new covenant that God talks about, where he says, I'm going to take, uh, I will give you a new heart. It says, I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a, what, a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my, what, my spirit in you. So that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. You see, when the Spirit spoke to them and said, yeah, give. This is going to be good for you. Give. Maybe he didn't tell them an amount, but he said, give, give. And they felt that tug of the Holy Spirit. They started to respond, but then they said, oh, no, that's a little bit too much. No, nah, we're changing our minds. Nah. And they're pushing back on the one who gave them the message. They're not only resisting the Holy Spirit, they're resisting God. This here. The fact that they mentioned you've only, that Peter says you've lied to God and not to man, but to the Holy Spirit, and later says you've lied to God, puts Holy Spirit and God together. It's a Trinity text. You see what they were doing. This greed and covetous leading to the sin of lying and blatant hypocrisy was pushback on the Holy Spirit, the main character in the book of Acts. It was the seed of self control. Self governance that was contrary to what God wanted to do, not only in Ananias and Sapphira, but in the whole Christian community. As we close today, I want to tell you a story of when I was in high school. I don't know, I want to see a show of hands. I'm curious. How many of you ever went to, when you were in high school, went to a banquet or a prom? Raise your hand. Oh, I see lots of hands going up. Okay, you're remembering right now, right? You hope there's no pictures that floating around out there to prove it, but you went. Well, I was 15. I was a sophomore at my public high school. At that high school that year, they made an exception, and they said, normally, at the end of the year, we have a junior-senior prom, and uh, it's a time where just the juniors and seniors can celebrate. But this year, we're opening it up to sophomores as well. I said, great, I get to go, and I immediately knew who I was going to take. You see, there was this girl that I had met at a summer arts camp the year before. We kept in touch. I thought she was pretty cool, and I was going to get her to go with me. So I called her. She lived about 30, 40 minutes away, and I called her. And I said, hey, you want to come with me to, to prom? I was so nervous. My first time asking, asking a girl out to an event like this. She thought about it for a second. She said, sure, that'd be fun. I was so excited. Oh, it's all I could think about for weeks and weeks. I went and I, I, I got, 
my money that I didn't have a lot of money, but I took a good chunk of it and I went and went to the tuxedo rental place, popped $100 out and got my first tuxedo I'd ever worn in my life, made sure and got a nice flower corsage as big and as beautiful as I could find for her, found out what color she was wearing, coordinated everything. I was telling everybody, guess who I'm bringing? And I told them her name. I was so excited for that night to arrive. Well, we show up at her house. I pull in and I'm nervous, my hands are shaking. Walk into the house and we, we take the typical pictures by the fireplace, right? You know, you go in and you stand there and the guy puts his arm around her awkwardly, you know, cheese, you know. And the parents take the pictures, oh, you look so cute. And then we take a few more and then, okay, we gotta go, we're gonna be late. So we head out and as we're, we're driving off, as we're heading out outside the, her house, we're, we're not even to the car yet and I look at her and I say, Man, you look beautiful in your, in your, in your gown. She, she turns to me, she goes, don't tell me that. That's all I've heard all day long. I said, did I do something wrong? I thought you were supposed to give a compliment, you know? I shook it off. We get in the car and we're driving and we talk, small talk, and as teenagers often do, you know, trying to avoid awkward subjects. And we get closer to the, to the banquet facility where it's at. And, and as we're, we're pulling in, she after a moment of silence, she looks at me. She goes, um, so what's the deal with this thing tonight? She goes, um, do I have to stay with you the whole time? I was beginning to realize that this choice of a date may have been a bad idea. And I thought, is that how you want to react to me? I have been, you have been all I've been thinking about, woman, for the past six weeks. I've got your picture up in my locker at school. I'm getting ready to brag on you. I'm getting ready to show my friends how I know other people outside of our social circle. I even brought handkerchief along so my palms wouldn't get sweaty. She went in and she was less than thrilled to be there. We got punch and refreshments and we sat at the table, but she quickly found her way. Oh, I got to go to the restroom. Oh, I got to go to this. She looked bored. She walked around, introduced herself to a few people. My heart was hurt, as much as my 15-year-old lovesick mind could be. <laughs> I got over it pretty quickly. But I wonder, friends, if we don't treat God sometimes the same way. He's a passionate lover pursuing us and wanting a relationship with us. He likes us. He actually likes us despite our flaws. And he comes to us. But we say, do I have to spend all week with you? You know, I don't mind sitting in church with you, but do, do I have to spend all week with you? I mean, I'll give you some money, but do I, do I really have to think of you every time I purchase stuff and spend my money? This is hard-earned money. Do, do, do you really have an opinion on what I watch, God? I don't know about that. It reminded me, what if, what if we actually sang a hymn, the hymns, as we actually live our lives sometime? What would it sound like? What about the familiar hymn we all know? All to Jesus. What if we sang it like my date might have sang our relationship? Some to Jesus I surrender. Some to him I freely give. I will sometimes love and trust him in his presence, occasionally live. I surrender some. I surrender some. Some to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender some. Some to Jesus I surrender. Make me, Savior, partly thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit, but not too much. I, I'm mostly mine. Some to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I loan myself to thee. Fill me with some love and some power, but may all thy blessings fall on me. I surrender some. I surrender some. Some to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender some. What are you willing to surrender to God? You know, he just is so crazy about you. He only asks for one thing. All of you. He wants your full attention. He says, I, the Lord, am a jealous God. He wanted to be with Ananias and Sapphira. He wanted all of them. 
but they weren't willing to give it. He knew that. What are you willing to give to Jesus? To call upon the one who has given all to us. I'm so grateful we serve a God who loved not only Annas and Sapphira, but us when we are pretenders. In fact, if you're listening and you're hurt by someone who was a pretender, then know that Jesus knows the pain of pretenders, doesn't he? Hypocrites nailed him to a tree. I'm glad I love a God who serves and loves the pretenders in this room. What are you willing to give to him? Will you call on the name of Jesus today? Thanks for stopping by. I hope and pray that this message was a blessing for you. If you'd like to see more content like this, we need your help. You can support the Keene Seventh Adventist Church Media Ministry by going to AdventistGiving.org, finding the Keene Seventh Adventist Church in Texas, and then putting in your donation to the media line. Your faithful giving and support allows us to spread the gospel online for you and others to participate in. Thank you for your continued support of the Keene Seventh Adventist Church.